He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, welcome to Grace Lutheran Church here in Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm Pastor Aaron Gust. It's good to be with you. Today we celebrate the fifth Sunday in the season of Easter. A Sunday where we mark how the Lord, well, how he brings about salvation by making all things new. Jesus isn't into rehabilitation. He's not into restoration projects. No, to work eternal life, he does it through dying and rising, beginning with his own death on the cross and rising from the dead, giving us a safe place to come and die to our sins that we may be raised in him as new creations. Order of service is page 260 in the Lutheran hymnal, or the Lutheran service book. It's on page 260 there if you have one at home. If not, I'll provide as much as we can on the screen that you can follow along and join in worship. As we do, I pray the Lord to turn your hearts and minds uh, and your ears to hear his holy word and receive Christ in that word for your salvation, where he will. Well, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We sing our Old Testament canticle. The first reading we have for this fifth Sunday in Easter comes to us from the book of Acts from St. Luke, the gospel writer. He writes, now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. 
I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we went and entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Revelation. Here we have St. John the Evangelist, the gospel writer, and he writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall no, or be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to gospel. Our gospel reading this morning is from St. John, the same one who writes the book of Revelation, uh, from St. John chapter 16. Here he accounts Jesus' words. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. 
Jesus knew they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, but will be, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Together, we join in confessing the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We confess also our faith in the triune God. We confess it in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, we sing together now our hymn of the day, hymn 466, Christ has arisen, alleluia. Hymn 466 or on the screen.
Well, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each one of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who makes all things new through his own atoning death and his sacrifice. Risen from the dead, he has destroyed all of our enemies, that we may stand before you and with him in peace. Amen. Well, grace and peace and mercy are all yours through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear baptized, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, it is the fifth Sunday of Easter. Only two more weeks to go before Pentecost. But have you noticed how our Easter greeting seems to be wearing down a little bit? Not quite as joyous as it was five weeks ago. Why is that? Could it be that there are so many things on our minds? So many things other than Christ. From the troubling news, the war in Ukraine, uh, maybe the fact that there's good things on our mind. Things like, it's spring outside. Well, it's a little rainy today, but for the most part, it's starting to get nice out. And we want to get out there and get as much spring in as we can. So whether it's troubling things or good things, things preoccupy our minds. Which is why we must return again and again to the precious good news of the resurrection. Good news, which is like a multifaceted diamond. And today, you know, the the facets on there, the facet that we are going to look through on this beautiful diamond uh, is a clear point that comes throughout all of the three texts we have heard, read to us today. It's a facet which proclaims that the Lord makes all things new. Behold, I am making everything new, says the crucified, risen, and ascended, and enthroned Jesus Christ in Revelation 21. And our Lord can say this because that's just what his death and resurrection accomplished. He has made everything new. The truth that is seen in the fact we are actually in churches on Sundays. You see, Sunday is the first day of the week, not the last day day of the week. It's not the seventh day. It's not the day of rest. It's not the sixth day, the day when man was created. But it is the first day of a newly created week. Because the old one had fallen, the Lord needed to make it anew. This is something the early church fathers took note of. Christ rose on the eighth day or the first day of a new week. And so through Christ's death, the old order of things is passing away. And through his resurrection, the new order has already come, which is a challenging yet remarkable thing to think about, that we live in the the in-between time with one foot in the old creation and one foot firmly planted in the new. St. Paul put it this way, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has already come. This means, even as I speak and as you are now hearing it, uh, you remain a sinner, sinful. So do I. So does the whole world. We are sinful from birth. Sinful from the moment you were conceived. Dead in your sin and dying every step of the way. Yet, as I speak and you now hear, you are also a new creation in Christ. You are redeemed. You are raised up. You are renewed. You are resurrected. And friends, that is 200 proof. 
good news. It's good news that you are resurrected and not rehabilitated. You see, God doesn't do rehab. He doesn't do repair jobs. He's not into restoration projects. No, he kills and he makes alive. Remember, it's through death and resurrection that Jesus makes all things new. A theme which overshadows the whole Bible from Genesis right on through to Revelation. Dust you are and to dust you shall return. And yet, through that same death which came as a curse of man's sin, through it, God works life. By embracing our death in the flesh, Christ, the Lamb of God, destroys our death in his own death. And in his resurrection, he literally grants eternal life. He is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. Such good news. But as we look around today, we so easily see the old order of things passing away right before us, right under our noses. From those mass casualties we hear that are going on in Ukraine to the more subtle death we see when we look around and we see like the good old days passing away, values and different things that may be shifting, more subtle death to things that were better. Of course, more painfully and more personally, you see death working in your families. You see it happening in and with your neighbors and even with our own bodies. Jesus told his disciples today, now you will grieve and weep. He's referring, of course, to his own death But those tears and the pain, the suffering and the sorrow are simply common expressions of death's reality. They are a sign of the breaking down of this old world, this earth. It's a breaking down of our bodies. It's a breaking down of our minds. But according to our old man, you know what, sometimes... He thinks he's more than he is. He thinks he can save things. He thinks we can save the planet. He thinks he can save the nation. He thinks he can save our way of life. And we think we can save ourselves. According to the old Adam, we trust that rehab is the answer. Throw enough money at any problem and you think you can solve it. Just give us our marching orders, the old man says. Tell us what to do and we'll turn this thing around. Whatever that thing is in your life that needs turning around. I want you to consider this. We think we can save the planet from global warming. Yet in first world countries, we can't even get clean water to everybody. Not that we shouldn't try, not that it shouldn't be a priority, not that we shouldn't be extremely good stewards of the earth, for the Lord has made us stewards of the earth. But to think we can save it? Well, he promises a new earth is going to come. So this old one will be destroyed one day, and we can't do a thing about it. But we are chronic rehabbers. We are chronic fixer-uppers. We see ourselves, our lives, as a kind of work in progress. God at work making me better, applying a patch here and there to my problems. But this, my dear friends, is the original recipe for religion. Religion in the negative sense. Rehabbing the Christian has led to man striking bargains to man cutting deals with God. I heard a preacher from another church body talking about Noah and the flood. 
And his comment on it was that the problem and answer to this biblical account was the following. His solution was, get right with the planet, and then God will get right with you. Well, that's the ultimate deal cutting, if I've ever heard it. This approach to God leads people to make deals and do things in the hopes of gaining his favor or padding our ledgers, making us look a little better. In more religious, religious terms, we might say it this way, get your prayers right and do the right things and then God will solve your problems. Maybe. He never promises to solve all of our little problems, but he did solve the big one. Christ and his church, friends, are not here to help us wiggle out of our everyday little problems or buy off their existence, whether it be a dying planet or a death looming at your door. Jesus came to see you and I and the world through it by squaring you up to the problem and then dying to it. And this is what Jesus is up to on the heels of his own death. In the hours leading up to the cross, he reminds his disciples that grief and sorrow will mark their lives. In a little while, they won't see him anymore. He will die and rise and ascend into heaven. And they too will all die. And some of them, they will die horrible deaths. You see, being a disciple didn't mean that they had a free pass in this life from suffering. There was no exemption for them from dying in this world. But there is a promise in the midst of this dying. The promise of the Holy Spirit, whom Christ sends out of his own death and resurrection. Remember, Jesus said, unless one is born anew, unless one is born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, unless one is born of water in the Spirit, unless you become a new creation, recreated by the Holy Spirit, creatively working through the water, you cannot be saved. Friends, St. Paul spoke Christ's words this way, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, no amount of rehab, no amount of retooling, no amount of reworking with gum and baler twine can make us fit for life in our Lord's heavenly city. Instead, we must be reborn. We must be recreated, rebirthed, not simply changed or fixed up, a new coat of paint, for how can you fix a natural born sinner? You can't. Now, you might be able to civilize the old Adam. You might be able to teach us a few manners. Keep our sins polite and respectable. But you can't make him fit for citizenship in the kingdom of God. Only a death and resurrection in Jesus can do that. And that's what happens daily as you live out the promises of your baptismal life. Dear friends, the old order of things is passing away. The new order has already come in Jesus. When Christ left the tomb open and empty that first Easter morning, something more happened than the resurrection of one man from the dead. No, it was the rising of the whole dead creation. It was the resurrection of a new humanity, a new heavens and a new earth. On that first day of the week, a new creation stepped forth out of the tomb. For you see, just as Jesus gathered all, including you and I, or you and me, into that darkness of his death, so also he included all, everyone in his resurrection. He included you. He included me. You and I are the new creations in Christ. The old is gone. The new has already come. And this new creation gift has come to you through the sacrament of washing and rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit through baptism. 
And by faith, not by sight, only by faith, can you already know the gladness even in the midst of sadness. In today's gospel, Jesus uses a powerful image to teach this whole point. He uses an image about rebirth. He said it's like a woman in the midst of labor pains. When the baby is finally born, she forgets the pain for the joy that her child has been born. You know what? If she didn't forget the pain, there would never be a second or third child. Thank goodness, because I wouldn't be here. I'm number three. Paul wrote, Our present sufferings do not compare with the glory that will be revealed to us in Jesus. He said the whole creation, not just we human beings, but the entire world, including the plants and animals, the land and the sea, they all groan awaiting the redemption of our bodies in, Christ, in the resurrection. And it groans as though it is in labor. Now, plants and animals don't sin, but they suffer because of our sin. The whole created order suffers with the labor pains of the new creation as death gives way to life. And until the last day, until our last day, we will struggle with one foot dangling in this world, the world which tries to answer life's problems with religious rehabilitation while refusing to recognize the true problem of sin and death, and the devil. While at the same time we stand firmly through faith with our other foot planted in the new creation, daily dying and rising in Christ for forgiveness, life, and salvation, that e living the baptized life. But in doing this, we may face life on this side of heaven with hope, friends, and we can do it with joy, because God has justified us. He has made us right. He's forgiven us through Christ. So that every problem, from a groaning, dying world, to our own sickness, disease, and death, to every challenge we face in this life, we may face them with peace. The peace which surpasses all human understanding. Simply confessing our sins and clinging to the new life we have according to God's spirit-filled word. The word which assures us that the sorrow, it's only short, but the joy, friends, the joy is eternal. It reminds us that grief is for a moment, but that gladness is forever. So also, Jesus said, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. Why? For he is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, may the peace which surpasses all human understanding guard and keep our hearts and mind joyous in our Lord's death and resurrection. Amen. We join in the prayers of the church. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, for all those in prison for the faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the sick and the dying, for those whom we now name in our hearts, and for all those who would care for our loved ones and those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the end to all wars and conflict, 
for peace to come. For the Lord has broken the bow and shadowed the spear for the end of hatred and the love of our fellow neighbor and brothers. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all of our other needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our collect of the day. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you've promised, that among the many changes of this world our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear, read, mark, and learn them, that we may take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold flat, fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We sing our New Testament canticle. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Well, as we go forth this week, we now know the Lord, while well, he makes all things new. He turns from the bad and the sin of this world uh, things that give us joy knowing that we have eternal life and salvation in him, that we have a safe place to come and die to our sins, that we may rise in him as new creations. Go in his peace. Amen. <laughs>